YouTube, it's Faye, and for today's video, we're gonna talk about warped brake rotors. Yeah, here goes. When I hit the brakes, going like between 50 and 60 miles an hour, especially downhill when like most of the weight is in the front of the vehicle, the steering wheel shakes terribly. And that is because I decided to be cheap with myself and get the crappiest brake. Here we go. You can hear that because my little chickens are hitting against the little plastic surround of my stereo there. Oops, now I got a 35 mile an hour speed so I better slow down again. While my problem with Grim seemed most apparent in the steering wheel, brake vibration problems can also manifest as like a general body vibration or a pedal pulsation as shown here in this official Toyota Technical Service Bulletin from 1994. <laughs> I was able to verify that my front brakes were the problem by getting the truck up to speed, and then I would lightly pull on the emergency brake. Not super hard, obviously, we're not trying to lose control here. Um, and then what happened was I was not experiencing the same symptoms. So also, when I was driving down the road without any braking, the shaking did not occur. And as you can probably imagine, warped brake rotors are not the only potential cause of steering wheel and body vibration like we just saw, and we should never make assumptions. So before diving into a brake replacement, let's first take some thickness measurements to verify that our rotors actually have excessive lateral runout. Okay, so we got a few different dial indicators that we can use. Um, actually, this one is one of my favorites. It's not the one I'm gonna use today, but this is like a clamp style. It's got this threaded piece right here and this nifty gadget threads in there. Um, and you can pretty much put it in any shape that you want and then like lock it into position just by turning this dial here and um, that is attached to this guy. But the one I'm gonna use today actually is this one right here with the magnetic base and um, all, pretty much every single axis of this is adjustable. So this is gonna be pretty awesome. And because I know my subscribers, um, I will link this amazing mat in the description below. And no, I'm not gonna do a toolbox tour because I have like five toolboxes and they're all too small. And as much as I love this one, none of my crap fits in it. All right, so in order to check our rotor run out, I'm gonna use this gear wrench dial indicator. So let's first talk about how to read it and how to properly set it up. So each one of these little marks indicates one thousandth of an inch, and we can tell that because it tells us right here. Now, according to the factory service manual, we are only allowed a maximum run out of, the way that I would say this is 28 10 thousandths or maybe 2.8 thousandths of an inch. However, if you're an actual machinist like my friend Danny, you would probably say that's two and eight tenths. But even if we come up with one and two tenths, or 1.2 thousandths of an inch, Toyota recommends that we perform a phase matching procedure. So, knowing that, let's get this wheel off and set up our dial indicator and see where we're at. Now you can see here that I'm reinstalling the lug nuts to hold our rotor tightly onto the hub to reduce any unwanted movement and also mimic the wheel being installed. So next I'm positioning the tip of the plunger at a 90 degree angle on the rotor surface at about the center of the friction surface. Although some Toyota service manuals will specify actually 10 millimeters or less than half of an inch from the outside edge of the rotor. So I'm also gonna do that too. And now whether you zero out the gauge or not is completely up to you. Just do whatever is easiest for you to get an accurate reading. And I always like to record myself taking the measurements, like actually with my phone. <laughs> so that I don't have to second guess myself and I can look back and take screenshots of the extremes that the needle moves. Also, we're gonna be measuring the total movement. So we're gonna be adding together both the negative and the positive movement of the needle. Knowing that our maximum allowed run out is two and eight tenths, we want our needle to move less than three of these little bars. And you can see that I'm actually exceeding four. I'm almost at five bars here just on this one rotor. So clearly I'm at a specification. Now, if you don't have a dial indicator like this, you can also use a micrometer and measure around the entire rotor, taking six to 12 measurements, depending on the manufacturer. Toyota recommends dividing the rotor surface into eight equal parts and measuring with the micrometer at each location. So you can do that, or you can click the link below to get the same dial indicator with a magnetic base like I have. All right, so now that we know what the problem is, what is the solution? And in my case, and in probably most of y'all's cases, the solution is to perform a full brake job. That's brand new rotors, or machine them with an on-car brake lathe, which 
I do not have, but Toyota recommends, and we used to use at the dealership, it's pretty fun, um, and new brake pads, because the pads themselves have been negatively affected by the warped rotors. Also, in my case, I know the problem was partially caused by the fact that I used really cheap rotors to begin with. They were on sale, what can I say? Um, and then I put them through a whole bunch of abuse because I like to pull my little trailer with all of my teaching 7Ms on it and go up and down hills and, you know, brake aggressively because it's Texas. Um, so I knew that like, even if I was to have an on-car brake lathe, just resurfacing these rotors was not gonna provide any sort of longevity or like long-term solution for me. I needed an upgrade. And a uh, kind of funny story, but I actually, uh, for those of you who watch All Girls Garage and who've heard me talk about it before, um, the entire show of All Girls Garage is completely unscripted. You know, we just sort of show up, there's cars, there's a project, we fix them, we talk about it, and we go home. Um, but the only part that is like slightly scripted are what's called like our, our break rooms. And even so, we don't actually have to follow the script, we can rewrite it, which I normally rewrite all of mine anyway. But um, this, <laughs> kind of funny, I got the script and I was reading it um, for Power Stop Breaks, which sponsored one of the All Girls Garage episodes. And in the script that the producer had written for me, like, a, you know, a suggestion, you know, with all the features and benefits and stuff like that, uh, it had said, like, how much I want one of these sets for my Forerunner because I tow trailers. I was like, wait a second is this set actually for a forerunner? And he was like, well, I, I don't know, but if it is, you can keep it. So uh, full disclosure, um, neither All Girls Garage nor Power Shop Breaks sponsored this video. However, I did get this kit for free. So heck yeah. My own advertising worked on myself. <laughs> Whoops. Anyway, so here's the kit that I got. This is not a marketing video. This is just for informational purposes only. Um, and actually, I I've already done a really, really thorough video on breaks, so I'm gonna link that right above here. Um, so I'm gonna sort of breeze through this and sort of highlight the ways that the Power Stop Brake Kit is different than you know, regular Toyota Brake Kit. And if you'd like something way more in-depth, then click that above right now and watch that. And uh, then maybe come back here when you're done. Just gonna slide this out. Brake pads, hardware, and all. I'm gonna set that aside. And now I'll just be able to pull the old rotor right off. I'm also gonna take care to inspect the mounting surface here. Any rust here can sometimes cause that rotor not to seat perfectly onto the hub. And then if that brake rotor doesn't seat properly onto the hub, well then, we're gonna pretty much be right back where we started, right? Because if this is not a flush mounting surface, then the rotor will be mounted slightly cocked a little bit. And then the first time that I go to hit the brakes and like see the pads, I'll be pushing against a non-flush surface. So I'm gonna once again get that excessive lateral run out. So that's not what I want. So I'm just gonna check this out and uh, it looks all right, but I'm gonna go ahead and clean it anyways. So I'm using the razor blade to scuff and to see if any large chunks come off. Sometimes like looks can be deceiving and I might look at it and it might look perfectly straight and fine, but then like, you know, some flakes might come off of it. All right, so easy, I can't possibly fail, right? Right here it says front passenger side, so I know that obviously this is the front and this is the passenger side and I'm going to install this rotor onto this hub. Now, uh, normally I just go ahead and clean off these rotors with brake clean. However, after reading the instructions, uh, PowerStop recommends that you clean them off with uh, soapy water. So, never done that before, but we're gonna try that today. <laughs> I'm gonna start by placing this backwards onto the hub and then clean it. Oh, and one thing that I should actually note before we go ahead and clean is that there's actually two different sizes of rotors for this generation 4Runner. So just make sure that you measure your rotor before you order the kit. So, um, I have uh, the two-wheel drive, low-end, lame model 4Runner. So I have the little front rotors. But just in case, you should always, 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 even though I measured it, ordered the kit accordingly, we should always double check and make sure that I did indeed order the kit with the smaller rotors and that the outside diameter is the same. And indeed, it is. So, all right, put, put you back there, put you up here. And I actually have some soapy water that I just use for like, checking for leaks in tires and stuff. You know, like finding finding where the tire is leaking from. Uh, all right, here goes. And of course, now that I'm filming a video, the neighbor decides it's like the perfect time to uh, go ahead and start cutting some trees. Fantastic. Okay, I also just want to note here that both PowerStop and Toyota recommend washing the rotors with soapy water. That's freaking weird, but whatever. To be honest, this is the first time that I actually went and looked in the actual procedure for replacing the brakes and found that in the Toyota factory service manual, but I have never been trained that way and I've never seen anyone in the dealership do it that way. So, whoops. <laughs> 
After washing the rotors with the soapy water, I then rinsed them off with a garden hose and then one final rinse with distilled water, cause why not? Fun fact, I also use a garden hose to wash the cicadas out of the trees to quiet them down for the filming of this video. However, the garden hose method did not work on my neighbors that were cutting the trees. So as a result, that stayed in the video. Oh well. Okay, and now I put three of the lug nuts back on and that's just to seat the rotor nicely against the hub so that it you know, looks fine and I can measure it once again for any run out if I felt like I had any problem with the hub. Now obviously the hub looked like perfectly fine, the mounting surface looked great in my opinion, um, but if you had any doubts on whether you did a good job cleaning the back of that or if it just like looked nasty and you weren't sure, I can go ahead and put my dial indicator on and measure this for run out yet again. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go ahead and put my new caliper on because uh, I feel good about this and I'm excited. I want to I wanna get it on there. Okay, one thing that I did was I swapped over my little speed bleeder here from the other brake caliper that I removed, and uh, I set that brake caliper aside, I will use that as a core in the future. And this guy, I'm just gonna, <laughs> installation is pretty simple, I've got my two bolts right here, and some Loctite, where did I put it? Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm just gonna put a little bit of Loctite on both of these bolts. Just a little bit. Just like a teeny bit there, and then like I roll them together, so like, Nothing crazy, like nothing crazy. Just a little added protection there. It's really easy to overdo Loctite, man. I see people just going all crazy. And now like the cool thing about this is because I'm swapping calipers, the pistons are already fully compressed, so I don't have to worry about like, you know, getting out my piston depressor tool. I'm just taking the old one off and putting the new one on. So this is like the easiest brake job in the world. I absolutely love it. All right, and then I'm gonna torque both of them to 90 foot pounds. Now for the pads. Okay, and now for the brake pads and I'm actually really freaking stoked on these. Now for those of you who know me, like I'm kind of a stickler for factory Toyota everything. I mean, aside from like this one time when I put on the previous brakes and uh, I just totally, like I said, cheaped out on myself and uh, no, screwed myself over. Made my life twice as hard having to do this job again. But now, of course, I've got this epic, epic upgrade. So we've got these ones with little squealer tabs built in just like stock. They're also chamfered just like the factory pad. And they also come with like this super nice like stainless steel backing plate. Now normally when, you know, I do this job at the dealership or actually for any of my customers and I'm using the Toyota factory pads, which I like, this is gonna be an experiment for me because Aside from like this cheaping out that I did before, I put factory Toyota stuff on everything because it's like no matter what I put on there otherwise, it makes a whole bunch of noise. And even when I use a Toyota factory pad, I'll peel off this backing plate and I'll lube it underneath, like you saw if you've watched my previous brakes video about how to do brakes on Toyotas. Um, in this case, they say don't do that, only lube in all the other external places, and I'll go over those in a second. So I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna follow their directions, give them a chance and uh, not like overthink everything and do things like I normally do. I'm gonna do things how they want me to do, so we'll see. Um, also, this backing plate is powder coated as well. So like, I don't know, this is the most powder coating that my truck has ever had on it. So this is kind of, this is kind of exciting. So we've got the inside pad and the outside pad. And these are actually, you know how fancy these are? These are like some sort of carbon fiber, what are they? Let's see, carbon fiber infused ceramic formula for superior braking power. Thermal scorched. The pad surfaces are thermal scorched for a fast break-in. Chamfered and slotted like a wee. High temp lubricant included. Oh, how did I not notice those? Where is the, where is the, where is the lubricant? Definitely want to use their lube. I'm all about using fancy lube when, oh. Oh yeah, high temp lubricant included. And oh my gosh, look at look at this. <gasps> it's got a little diagram, like you really cannot fail. This is great, my lubricant to all these surfaces. Will do, my friends, will do. Just a little dab will do you here. Careful, of course, to avoid the friction material. I'm going to lubricate this part of the pad and then also the back side where it's gonna come in contact with the caliper pistons. I can also go ahead and apply a little bit to the pistons themselves since they're pushed all the way back and there's really no danger of me accidentally getting any on the rotor. Obviously it's like the big thing, right? You don't wanna, you don't wanna get any on the rotor. <laughs> That's like the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish here by upgrading our brakes. You don't wanna make them slippery. All right, so there is our inside pad and I'm just gonna slide it in place. And of course it's gonna be a little loose because those pistons are pushed all the way out. So I'm just gonna go ahead and stick that guy in just to hold it while I get the other pad ready. All right, and here's my other pad. I'm gonna do the same thing. 
perfect. Nice. Then this little guy. So I like to use the little ends of this to stick into the little pins and just rotate the pin to like where it needs to be facing in order for it to, you know, be installed. So we'll do that first. It makes it a lot easier. That guy in there, and I think what I might do is give this guy a little squeeze. I like to thread these in by hand first. Just make sure that you start these guys by hand because you can run into a lot of trouble if you cross thread these. So just use caution. Always do my final tighten with my line wrench so get a good grip on it. Torque spec on this is like minimal. It's like 11 foot pounds. <gasps> clean the area really well. Got a little brake clean on my rag. All right, now we're up here. I'm just gonna pull this guy back into place. Sometimes coaxing him is a little difficult. Come on, friend. And we got this clip. There we go, let's see. I love this hammer. This was a junkyard find. <laughs> All right. So we are now done on this side with the exception of bleeding the brakes, but I'm gonna bleed both sides at the same time. So now I'm gonna move on to the other side. And because it started to rain, I just went ahead and knocked out the driver's side real quick, but the driver and passenger side are the same. You don't need to see the same thing twice. However, if you are interested in seeing my brake fluid flushing video, Click that little button up above and check that out because it's a really good video and really in-depth. So I think that the main step where this brake replacement procedure differs from the factory Toyota service manual is that there actually is a break-in or a burnishing procedure that you've got to do once you install these brakes. Now, Toyota actually is pretty interesting. If you look through the factory service manuals, they never specify a break-in procedure at all. They normally just say, all right, we'll install the wheel and uh, torque to specification and you're done. It's like, oh, well. Is that it? So in order to figure out what exactly they wanted, I went to their OEM manufacturer, Akebono's website, for more information. And they claim that their ceramic disc brake pads do not require this step because they are precision engineered to perform and mold to your rotors over time. Thus, there's no specific burnishing procedure needed with Akebono brake pads. This is not true for PowerStop. Check out this box. Okay, so here's the instructions that are on the back of the brake pad box. And we can see right here that step one is that they want us to take five moderate to aggressive stops from 40 down to 10 miles an hour in rapid succession without letting the brakes cool and do not come to a complete stop. So we're gonna make sure that we do this like on a highway or something like that. If you're forced to stop, complete the stop and either shift the vehicle into park or give room in front so you can allow the vehicle to roll slightly while waiting in the traffic light. Okay. The rotors will be very hot and holding down the brake pedal will force the brake pad to contact the rotor and possibly create an imprint on the rotor. This imprint may contribute to the creation of brake judder. Uh, I'm not sure what that word means, but I'm assuming that it's um, gonna be what we experienced at the beginning of this video, which is uh, excessive lateral run out and brake vibration. So uh, we're just trying to do everything that we can to avoid that. The next step is continue to break in by completing five moderate stops from 35 miles an hour to five miles an hour in rapid succession. Without letting the brakes cool, you should expect to smell some resin as the brakes get hot. After this is complete, continue to drive the vehicles for as long as possible without keeping the brakes excessively and without coming to a complete stop. Try for about five minutes at a moderate speed. This is the cooling stage. After the brakes have cooled to standard operating temperature, you may use the brakes normally. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this video and if you did, well, fantastic. That makes all my laborious hours of editing this thing worth it. I will see you in my next video. Bye. Hello. 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 Yes, Luna.